following is my conversation with David Atkinson at Z Sphere. David has been passionate and dedicated to a mission of sustainable living and how to use resources on planet Earth, our home, in a very smart, judicious, effective, replenishable fashion. As part of uh, David's mission, his company Zsphere has come up with innovative solutions for sustainable living in areas that are susceptible to uh, floods and hurricanes and other such uh, mother nature uh, related uh, or human induced calamities. We talked a lot about his approach to solving those problems, some of the designs of uh, Z Sapir. So Z Sapir is just not a brand name. It is a scientific concept uh, with commercial deployability and a lot of engineering behind it, still a lot of R&D going on as well. Uh, it is pretty clear at this point that disruptions to our daily lives uh, through intense climate related events are going to become norm. And it is all about how we prepare. Supply chains as we know them today are going to get disrupted in many edge case scenarios. So when you are living on the edge, what do you do? That is what David and I are talking about in this conversation that what are the sustainable solutions for living and power and food and water, and sanitization, self-help, sustainability. We talk about Puerto Rico and many other communities that where David is studying and implementing his initial designs, his initial working prototypes. This is a very different kind of conversation and it impacts all of us in more ways than one. I am just amazed with and feel gravitated toward David and his team's dedication and mission. Hope you are going to enjoy this conversation the way I did, I had a lot of fun. And now here is my conversation with none other than David Atkinson at Z Sapir. Enjoy. All right, we are on. David, sir, how are you? I'm well, Anja, good morning. Thank you. David, I have been, uh, since the very first time that we met, I have been fascinated with your vision of uh, a better planet, a better home, sustainable, sustainable living, uh, just being smart with resources that mother nature has afforded us. And what is most amazing for me is how your vision uh, have grown all these years, your conviction behind your vision. And uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful story of you and your company, Z Sefer. Uh, so I think it'd be awesome, maybe a good starting point, David, if you want to uh, tell the audience about your dream, your vision, and you know, let's uh, start telling the story. You know, so we, uh, uh, I am just uh, myself very drawn to it. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure people are gonna see uh, why that is. So uh, over to you, my friend. Thank you, Amjad. And, and again, appreciate the invitation 
and uh, and opportunity to be with you today. So the the Z sphere we have to rewind about ten years, and this was as as it was with most inventors, or should I say, many inventors out there. Many go to bed one night and they are presented with an epiphany, a, a vision, and and you know just. Uh, details that they would otherwise, you know, uh, not have experienced. And, you know, the only way to explain it is there's some sort of, you know, divine, you know, aspect to it, yeah. you know, whether it's Thomas Edison or an Elon Musk or whoever it might be, you know, each one of each one of us has a vision at some point. And it happens different with everyone. In my case, I went to bed one evening and I woke up the next morning and all of the details in terms of what the end product and, and capabilities were to be, that's what I was presented with. And I, I believe based on my experiences over the last 10 years, I believe my cumulative work and life experience and the different things that I've you know, gone through in my life prepared me for actually being able to deliver what Z-Sphere represents and actually maximize the value. And so that said, you know, Z-Sphere, I, I started off 10 years ago with, with this vision, and then I set out to build a prototype. And I built a, a, a prototype more for not so much a working prototype, but frankly, just to validate the, the structure since it is such a departure from conventionality. You know, we're talking a sphere versus a, huh. a, a geodesic dome, which is, which is different. It's never been done before. And so uh, at least on, a, on any sort of conventional scale. And so what I did was I built that prototype out in the Western high desert of New Mexico, because I knew I had something special and I didn't want anybody to see it. In fact, in fact, the only way you can see it is by satellite or Google earth. And so it's, there's a lot of interesting stories behind that, but what I did was I validated it. I validated it was possible and very realistic and pragmatic. And the other thing that I should mention is in my research behind what this really represented, I, I really discovered many things. And one of the things that I discovered is the, the design, the general design is based on geodesic designs and principles that were made very socially, uh, uh, people were made socially aware of it back in the 50s and 60s by a gentleman by the name of Buckminster Fuller. Mm. And so Buckminster Fuller was a brilliant man. In fact, you look at the, the design for Epcot at Disney, and that is a Buckminster Fuller design. And so I studied those designs over the years, and it, it was really the, the, greatest, the greatest part of that was being, I'm, I'm a complex systems expert. So whether it's information technology or natural systems, whatever they might be, and so what I set to task on was really understanding why wasn't Buckminster Fuller successful in, in massive adoption of this principle because he was truly a visionary. And so what I did was I set to task on figuring that out. And what I came to understand is that his designs were too complex. They were too complex to be deployed and scaled in mass. And so what I did was, and there were similar issues with others like Buckminster Fuller, which is why you don't see geodesic domes all over the world, right? Yeah. You see them in very niche settings, you know, yeah. very particular cases. And so I, I'm a businessman and I'm a pragmatist before I'm an engineer, right? I still have a propeller head, just, you know, propeller hat, just like anybody else, but what I did was I said, okay, this, this has to be very practical. It has to be something that's going to deliver many, many layers of value to compel people to, one of my favorite quotes from Buckminster Fuller is this, you can never fight an existing reality. What's more important is to create a new reality that makes the old one obsolete. 
And so that's what we are doing at Zsphere is we are creating a new paradigm around building and building systems to specifically address the very real challenges that we have around climate change, the complexities and vulnerabilities of our power systems, our food systems, and just hazardous geographies in general. When you look at the, the bulk of the human population, where does it reside? It resides on coasts. It resides along rivers and in places that are very prone to natural disasters. Yeah. And so what Z-Sphere represents is, uh, is a balance. It's a new balance that allows we as human beings to live in harmony with the climate as it changes in such a way where it's not massively disruptive to us financially, physically, socially, economically, right? When you look at the, the natural disasters that are happening right now, whether it's in China or West Germany or Turkey or the West Coast with you know, uh, a drought of biblical proportions, when you look at those natural disasters that are happening right now, they're tremendously disruptive. Look at, look at all of this, the disruption just to farming because of the lack of access to water. Yeah. And so having a system like ours that allows you to, uh, it allows you to be incredibly resilient to these climate changes as they occur, because they, based on our research of last decade, and, and it doesn't matter what side of the climate change spectrum you're on, whether it's man-made or whether it's natural or, or what it may be, it doesn't matter. Our research has shown that, yes, we as humans are dramatically affecting the environment. There's no question about that. But what our research has shown is that we are just getting started with the level, the, the, the number and severity of the natural disasters that we are currently experiencing. So, and so that, yeah, right. And so that said, based on that research and, and based on what was shared with me, I, myself and my team, and our founders have created the world's first completely climate change resilient and truly self-sustaining building system. And when I say that in terms of self-sustaining, here's, here's what I mean by that. First of all, um, it's got an incredibly long life. The, the structure that we have, the materials and, and the, the supply chain and, and suppliers that we have it, it is a hundred plus year building. So we are going back to what our ancestors did. They built buildings that lasted, right? That were very valuable. And because they couldn't afford, you rewind back to the 1800s, the early 1900s, they could not afford to rebuild on a very frequent basis and rehab and everything else. It was too disruptive to them. And so we've, we've moved away from that. Z-Sphere intends to bring that back into vogue to where you have a system um, of living, of business, uh, of a uh, municipality, right? We have municipality applications, schools, whatever it may be, where these systems, you're going to be able to use these structures for over a hundred years and refine them and adapt them. And, and as new technology presents itself, really leverage that technology to actually create even further value than we have in our package today. So, so that said, the, <clears throat> given the climate is changing so aggressively, it's really prudent that we quickly position ourselves as these disasters happen. We'll take Puerto Rico, for example. Puerto Rico is a tremendous focus of ours because the disruption was so significant to the island. And we have spent the last, well over the last year on the island of Puerto Rico on the ground, navigating the political spectrum. Many, many business people understand the challenges of doing business in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And so I spent the last many years putting together a team of the best of the best and, and people with integrity and, and people that know how to get things done because we are, we are movers and we are action oriented. We get things done where nobody else does. And that's what that's part of what makes us special. And I knew I had to do that because we're dealing with a, a new concept. There's a lot of education required. There's a lot of 
really understanding how to um, how to help people understand the value and why it's so important to consider this alternative. And what we've seen is the the events of the last year, whether it's COVID or you know hurricanes or earthquakes more recently here in Puerto Rico. So what they what are our prospective clients on the island have seen is nothing but validation for what we've been sharing with them over the last year. And so it's, it's put us in a position where we've secured multiple MOUs with very progressive thinking municipalities. We're working with several private developers on the island. We are going to build the first resilient communities in the world, fully resilient yeah. communities in Puerto Rico. And Puerto Rico, I believe, and, and many share this vision, Puerto Rico is coming out of a decade-long depression and economic yeah. slump. And uh, there's massive capital flowing into Puerto Rico right now. Many people are just trying to figure out how to navigate the waters. You know, there's tremendous tax incentives and, and other reasons to be there. It's just, there's reason it's called the island of enchantment. That's right. <laughs> And it's, it's a wonderful place to be. And so, you know, given that, it, it's a tremendous place for us to start. Um, it, it's, it is the poster child for climate change and the challenges around living on an island, being isolated from supply chains and, and accessibility to essential needs. And, you know, going back to what I was sharing with you about the resiliency of the sphere, you know, it, it's one thing to have a sustainable building. You know, you look at uh, the most recent big hurricane, Hurricane Dorian, that affected the Abacos, the Abaco Islands of the Bahamas. And it, it literally wiped out and, and destroyed 80 plus percent of the physical structures in most places on the island. And as you can imagine, it wiped out the power infrastructure, the water infrastructure, the wastewater treatment infrastructure. Yeah. And so... The challenge that islands like Abaco and Puerto Rico and others face is that when these major disruptive events happen, capital flight occurs. Yeah. People move away. Look at New Orleans and Katrina. New Orleans will never be the same. You know, people left by the tens of thousands and the capital went with them. Yeah. And so if you're, uh, you know, any level government official, if you are an investor, if you're a businessman, whoever you are, it's imperative that in these geographies, you begin to introduce something that is going to give you a continuity of life and business. And that's what the Z-sphere represents. It represents continuity of life and business, regardless of the circumstances. So one of the things that makes the Z-sphere very special and unique in the world in terms of its design is the fact that it's completely flood resilient. Yeah. So it, on the island of Puerto Rico, we're talking with a particular developer on the east coast of the island. It's actually a gorgeous uh, piece of property. It's 10 acres on the east side of the island. And one of the challenges that they're facing in looking to develop this property is that with Hurricane Maria, there was a six to seven foot storm surge on that, on that beach front. And so as you can imagine, if you're not designing this properly, it's completely disruptive to your power infrastructure and, and everything else. Yeah. So, so what the Z-Sphere does is we represent a complete departure from that conventional, those conventional limitations, so much so that right now we can accommodate between a five to a nine foot storm surge with our fixed wow. structure. Later this year, I've got designs that we're working on patenting right now for a 20 foot storm surge that actually allows our clients, whether you live in a static flood area, like along a river bank, you know, whether you're talking about the, the major floods in St. Louis of years past, or, you know, in Illinois and other places, or even Germany right now, what we do is we provide our customers with a flood, a completely flood resilient structure that allows the structure to rise in place when the floodwaters come. Yeah. And it's completely watertight, so you don't have to worry about loss of property or loss of life or anything like that. 
And then once the flood water or the storm surge subsides, it settles right back down into place. Yeah. So in, in the extreme cases, like an island of Puerto Rico, that's usually visited by a category three or four hurricane every three years. When you're looking at that level of disruption that frequently, what Z-Sphere does is Z-Sphere offers our clients this. When that event occurs, and we will look at every particular location where our clients are looking to have a business or a residence or a school or municipal critical infrastructure or whatever it may be, we will look at that site and we will determine, okay, we need a flood base, we need an earthquake base. Uh, Amja, we are completely earthquake resilient as well. The, the largest event, it, it, we will accommodate that as well. And so we address the wide spectrum of natural disasters in a single solution. That was very important to me was to be able to address uh, on, a, on yeah. a, a very broad spectrum those disasters because ultimately we will take our business global. Every geography is different. Every culture is different. The way that those cities and other places have been developed you know, in those areas. So you have to have a very dynamic system. And so we do. And so that said, what makes the Z-Sphere special when we go and, and we work with a client in a particular location is we will identify whether or not their current power grid or water infrastructure or wastewater treatment is compatible with the level of potential disruption to a disaster. And what we're doing differently that no one else is, is in addition to the resilient building, because it's, it's great to have a resilient building, but as people found out in Mexico Beach, Florida, a few years back, you can have the most resilient building, but if you don't have power, if you don't have fresh water and you don't have wastewater, it's the building's yeah. kind of useless, right? And so what I did was I, I looked at that and I said, okay, how can we further add value for our clients to compel them to move away from the traditional building systems of today. That's why you don't see a lot of domes in the marketplace yeah. is because there's not enough of a departure from convention in terms of value yeah. to tell people to adopt and embrace that, that architecture. So what we did at Zsphere is we've created completely resilient appliances for our clients that will provide them fresh water, power, and wastewater treatment in the midst of a hurricane. Not, not only before and after, but during a hurricane. Yeah. Completely resilient, you, you know, uh, essential needs. And so when we assess that particular location, we're looking at those different things. A lot of times our clients don't need resilient, our resilient power system because they got a very reliable power source. You yeah. know, maybe their power lines are underground and maybe it's hydroelectric power, right? Very reliable, very continuous source. So there are certain cases where our clients don't need our power system or our power appliance. But on the island of Puerto Rico, as many of you have heard over the last few years, they are, they are suffering regular power outages, not only from hurricanes, but just on a, in a general basis, their infrastructure is extremely old. Much of it has been uh, really, you know, patched and repatched and, you know, it's kind of a patchwork of things. There was really no, um, there was really no fundamental strategy around redesigning their infrastructure for resiliency and longevity. And so we're finding tremendous opportunity on the island there, as well as, as you can imagine, places like the Florida Keys and the, the southeastern coast of the U.S. We're starting here in the U.S. Our headquarters is just north of Jacksonville, Florida, on the coast of Georgia. And so it's, it's natural. Naturally, it makes sense for us to focus on this region where the natural disasters are very prevalent and Puerto Rico is not very far away. Uh, most people don't know, but the port of Jacksonville uh, ships and receives over 80% of the goods that flow in and out of Puerto Rico. And wow. so, yeah, so there's a reason we are logistically located here. Yeah. And so, um, so in, you know, I've, I've shared with you the value proposition around Z-Sphere and what we represent in terms of that, you know, disruptive nature of our design, et cetera. You know, let's talk about wind 
for a second. You know, I've talked about floods, you know, flood and water damage account, uh, accounts for over 80% of the financial loss during a natural disaster. Yeah. So, Before we go to uh, uh, when I want to say one thing, when you sure. the other day, you showed me uh, the, the designs and the models that you guys have built, uh, I must say, I was like beyond amazed. Uh, and then you, you know, the way you explained to me different functional and engineering characteristics, uh, I, I, was, I was like so amazed and I can totally see uh, in sort of, you know, we are in the middle of a climate change and uh, we all have started seeing the effects to your point, the, the rains, the storms, the winds, the fires, you know, and all the unpredictability that comes with that. And, and some, of, some people on planet earth are, you know, more unfor relatively unfortunate compared to others. I was this man so drawn to, to this. Uh, I am sure at some point in this conversation, you will tell people about uh, the, uh, the decades worth of intelligence and engineering that has gone into this beautiful patented design. In fact, last time when you and I were chatting, we were also saying, hey, look, you know, probably this is how we should be thinking about not only building sustainable living on earth, but you know, on other planets, you know, people uh, like Elon Musk and others, they are talking about, hey, let's go to Mars, you know, let's go here, let's go there. And uh, so I am just like in total amazement of the, all the, uh, not just the uh, uh, functionality, but all the engineering properties that you shared with me and, and all of that still to deliver a sustained quality of living. Uh, so anyways, I, I, I want, I'm just amazed. So uh, since you, are, you have put, it, put that on the screen, maybe you want to you know, talk a little bit about that and, and then we'll get into the, you know, all the topics of, uh, uh, that, you want to, that you want to talk about. Certainly, I'm John. Thank, thank you for that. And, and yet yeah, it has been, you know, o over the years, you know, this, this is something that you and I have been talking about for a long time, just in terms of, you know, back, back 10 years ago, you know, our discussion was around efficiencies and the fact that, especially in the United States, you know, we're very wasteful in terms of our energy consumption and just the way that we utilize resources. And so, the Z sphere is the antithesis of what our systems are today. So when you think of the Z sphere, think of hyper efficient. So what one of the things that we did, I, we solved many, many problems. And so the uh, I'll start with the design. So the, the beauty of a, uh, a geodesic structure and shape is the fact that it is the strong, when you, you boil it down to, you can look at honeybees, you can look at, you know, universal, you know, constructs and nature and otherwise geodesic forms, especially this geodesic shape is the strongest in, in the universe. And so it, it is there, there is a reason that honeybees operate in a six sided, you know, comb. And so uh, this is this is merely a reflection of you know that divine you know strength and integrity and and frankly um, ability to scale you know uh, um, we'll talk about bees for a second you know part of the amazing brilliance of honeybees is the fact that you can add additional sections to a hive and they will scale massively up in terms of their population and their ability to produce honey. And it's, that's part of the beauty in geodesic designs when they're done right, yeah. is that they're massively scalable. So the Z-sphere is no different. And you know, I shared earlier that I was able to determine what the deficiencies were in the earlier designs. And one of those deficiencies was the fact that they were not scalable. And 
what I did was I spent a tremendous amount of time figuring out how to create a scalable system and something that was um, incredibly versatile and relatively easy to build in terms of time and manpower and, and not only that, but actual resources materials. And so what you're looking at here is the 30 foot version of our building. We have three versions. We're doing a 20 foot version, which is slightly smaller than this. This is, that's really designed for the whole tiny house movement, the minimalist movement. Um, and again, designed to be something that's really caters to, you know, a couple or a couple of individuals. Maybe they want to live in an off-grid setting. Um, you know, one of the things that COVID has taught us and shown us in terms of our business model is we can literally work anywhere. You know, the tools yeah. exist today yeah. to be productive anywhere. Yeah. So many people are approaching us and they're asking us, hey, can I live out in the middle of Wyoming, completely detached from everything, power, water, et cetera? Can I do that? And the answer is with the Z-Sphere, absolutely you can. Because the satellite communications technologies today are so well advanced that you have absolute connectivity, whether you're in the middle of Wyoming or if you're in the middle of a city. Yeah. So uh, from that perspective, um, we've seen a tremendous amount of interest in off, you know, just off grid living, which yeah. we anticipated coming. We didn't know that COVID would help accelerate, you know, the awareness and the desire for people to not only live remotely, but it's also shown people a tremendous improvement in their quality of life, right? The, the fact that they don't have so to true. travel as much and, you know, et cetera. So getting back to the design here, what you're looking at is you're looking at our, our 30 foot structure. Again, we have a 20 foot that's designed for the tiny home movement. The 30 foot structure, that's really our, where our heavy lifting happens. That's kind of the sweet spot in our designs in terms of one of the, the probably the most popular unit that we are going to sell. The unit that you see here is, is kind of out of perspective because the way that the photographer took the photo I, I'm a big man. I'm on the left and, and yeah. I'm about six foot six. So this, this picture is a little bit distorted uh, just in terms of perspective, but this 30 foot structure that you see here, uh, this is going to be the, the home that I live in, in a model home, a, a working model home. And this building here is a three bedroom, two and a half bath structure. And the reason we're able to do that is because when you're talking about a sphere, it's not about square feet. No. A sphere is about cubic feet and how you utilize the contents of the interior space. And so as you can imagine, it's we're being- truly, It is truly three-dimensional as opposed to today, we live in a two-dimensional world and, and we many times stack up different two-dimensional worlds on top of each other but this is truly, to your point, truly, you know, three-dimensional. Absolutely. Good, good point. Yes. And so, so that said, we take, we take aggressive advantage of the space inside and, you know, very unique designs around our furniture and, and multi-purpose, you know, capabilities inside of given rooms, et cetera. And so the, the interior is, is, you can go on our website and you can look at some of our interior rending, renderings. They're, they're very conventional and traditional. So it's a very comfortable look and feel, right? It's not a tremendous yeah. departure. It, it's going to get more sophisticated over time as we uh, enhance our designs and our modularity. You know, <clears throat> getting back to the building system, the, this building is fully modular. So this this structure here was the very first production build that we've ever done myself and the gentleman in the hard hat with the light blue shirt on uh my my friend and colleague jim melcher jim and i and and our other two colleagues showed up much later in the process to help us wrap up the last uh you know the the finishing touches to it and it, it was truly a team effort but Jim and I, just the two of us, this is the first one that we had ever done, 
from bare ground, meaning there were no footings, there were no steel structure in place, none of it, from bare ground, less than three weeks to have this complete structure, which includes the structural floor on the inside. So yeah. it, is a raw, it is a raw building right now, but less than three weeks to get to this point. Just two guys. So that demonstrates and really shows the, the efficiencies and the, just the, our ability to put it together quickly and the modularity, the benefits of the modularity. On and, your topic of David modularity, uh, I know that you have shared with me uh, in the past that, look, you know, your vision is that on planet Earth, many communities, many families, they need to have a solution like this. So hence, scalability, modularity is key. In your vision, you know, we always first talk about, okay, let's we as people perfect what needs to be done. Uh, and then you try to, you know, automate uh, as much of it as you can in terms of the modularity of design, maybe, you know, uh, robotic systems, putting it together so that humans and machines working together, you know, they deliver efficient outcomes. Uh, the other sort of thing that I'll point out, David, here is that it's very exciting uh, to me is, uh, look, you know, uh, global supply chains, global networks, uh, global grids, power sources, other infrastructure, of course we need all of that. But in the face of disruption, uh, you want other types of solutions and options. You cannot just have one solution. You cannot just say, well, this is the way we recently built. This is one power grid that we have and, and that is the solution. You and I, we both know, you know any complex problem uh, where its complexity and unpredictability is growing like the climate on our, on our planet, you need all different types of solutions and outcomes. And you have also shared it with me that sustainability comes in many different dimensions. For example, there is no way the current insurance models, even when they are assisted by different federal governments and stuff, can keep bailing communities and people out year after year after year, pretty soon that model breaks down. And then, you know, if people are not smart about it, you find out you're kind of on your own. You, you, you David, have been just so you know, passionate about uh, not only this topic, but you mentioned uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, and they are still recovering from what happened over a decade ago. And uh, so hence this kind of thinking that how do you work with the finite resources and constraints that are available and you are still able to sort of sustain uh, quality of life and, uh, and whatnot. And, and to your point, David, universe is becoming more uh, digital, uh, with COVID, we, you know, many of us are able to work remotely. Uh, there is, you know, we are building these uh, satellite communication networks. A lot of that infrastructure already exists and is getting better, which, you know, luckily is not vulnerable to the same sort of things that we living on the ground, you know, are uh, sort of susceptible, vulnerable to. So my point is that this, this reality, I won't even now call it vision, it was your vision 10 years ago and your conviction brings us to this, uh, helps. Uh, it, it gives many dimensions to that solution, that answer. There's two things, there's two things that I wanna share based on, on what, you just, what you just shared with our audience. So the, the, first one, the first one is, is that 
the the moving moving forward, right? The great the greatest challenge that we've seen over the last 18 months, as you can imagine, is that no one knows that this exists. So everyone, everyone, you know, the greatest thing that we can be doing, and thank you again for the time today, is helping people understand that when we are dealing with adversity and these different changes and, and challenges in our business world or our personal lives, whatever else, there's a solution. Okay, that's first and foremost that I want to share with your audience. Secondarily, you just described earlier in your uh, your your segue around the inability for us to financially and otherwise um, socially continue this same behavior. Okay, insurance companies, we are going to find one or two progressive minded insurance companies, they are going to underwrite our systems, and they are going to completely change the paradigm around the insurance industry in disaster prone areas. Yeah, yeah absolutely. No question in my mind. Yeah. So, you know, those we, we are, we are continually seeking out those partners and whether it's insurance underwriters or mortgage underwriters, right, lenders, because this is a completely different paradigm shift for even lenders in terms of <clears throat> amortization, you know, and, and longevity of solutions, we provide inherent stability in that investment and confidence that that investment is, is going to be there for long haul. So that said, the next component is specifically a use case that talks about uh, our, our governments and officialdom not being able to maintain a status quo. <clears throat> the best case, the, the poster child for what you just described is Monroe County, Florida. Monroe County, Florida is the keys, the Florida keys. And right now, Monroe County, God bless them, right? They have been faced with tremendous adversity over the last several years. And their residents have also been decimated by many hurricanes. And so I, I am in the process, I've actually reached out to Monroe County planners and such recently in an effort to raise awareness around the fact that we have our solution, but also to help them address this problem. So FEMA, has a program out there where they will literally buy a person's land and property from them so that they can relocate out of Monroe County to another safer jurisdiction. And, and they're, they're paying a lot of money for that. As you can imagine, it's a very challenging process, right? It's not easy. But at the end of the day, there's this compelling reason to move. And so I shared with you earlier the fact of capital flight out of counties and out of regions, and it decimates the regions. Monroe County, because they have such a small population, everyone that leaves is it's significant to them. And so Monroe County is not enforcing the FEMA program and allowing their residents to stay because they can't afford the capital flight. And I'm here to share, you know, if anyone is, you know, listening from the Keys or from Monroe County, I'm here to share with you that we are ready to entertain discussions around beginning the process of building resilient communities. And, you know, whether it's resilient, you know, business structures, resilient utilities, micro utilities, we're going to have a, a separate conversation around that, Amjad. And so, what we are doing is, you know, inherently to, to close on that topic, what we are doing is we are introducing a solution that completely addresses the capital flight problem in disaster prone areas. Keep your residents there, keep your businesses there, create an environment in those disaster prone areas that quickly can recover when a disaster happens and it puts when, when our clients have one of our solutions, I want you to put yourself in their shoes. So if you're living in a conventional home and you're vulnerable, let's say it's the keys, uh, a category five hurricane comes through and it literally wipes you out, right? It wipes out your power, it wipes out your water, et cetera. 
as an individual, whether I am uh, an individual person or a business owner, et cetera, I'm powerless, right? So immediately I've been put in a victim state and I am looking yeah. outwards for assistance, okay? Which it's a challenge, right? Financially and socially, that's a great challenge. So it requires a tremendous amount of resources to, to help those people, which is exactly why FEMA has the incentives that they do for people to move because it costs FEMA less money to pay for their property than it does to have them live there and try and support them after a disaster. Yep. That's really the economics of the deal. And so now I want you to think about a Z-Sphere customer that has all of our capabilities. Let's say they have our freshwater appliance, they have our power appliance, and they can treat their own wastewater. So here's what happens. A category five hurricane comes through and let's say there's 10 feet of storm surge, okay? We have set our customer up such that, first of all, before the event, okay, they don't have to evacuate. Okay, think about the long, think about the, the visuals that you've seen of thousands of people evacuating and trying to flee, right? Yeah. So, the, the, the first thing that comes to mind is how many accidents and how many deaths and how many other things happened as a result of that evacuation, right? That in itself is a challenge. And, you know, granted, we're always going to have to evacuate certain portions of our cities, et cetera, because they just are not inherently designed for those disasters. So it's understandable. But for those clients in those regions that are able to adopt the Z-sphere, here's what happens. I'm inside of my sphere. This building that you see here is completely resilient up to 200 mile an hour sustained winds. We actually have a reinforced concrete version that we call the Z-Sphere Max. That is completely tornado resilient and that is 250 mile an hour sustained. The reason we have the Z-Sphere Max, the concrete version, is that a small segment of our clients up in tornado alleys or tornado prone areas, they regularly experience farm tractors, semis, automobiles, and other things, high mass objects flying through the air yeah. as a result of these tornadoes. So you have to have a structure that has the integrity that's going to be able to withstand that high mass event. And that's what the Z-Sphere Max is designed to do. This structure that you see in front of you is designed for 200 mile an hour sustained wind. It's designed for all of the, the debris impacts, you know, whether it's two by fours or sheets of plywood or whatever it is going through the air, it is designed for that. And so we have solutions to accommodate the entire spectrum of severity of, of circumstances. And so Getting, getting back to the, the being a Z-Sphere customer. So you're inside, you're hearing a lot of commotion outside, of course, with the 150 mile an hour, whatever winds they might be. When you have our power appliance and our water appliance and our wastewater appliance, and I know there's many people on this podcast that have lived through this experience, toilets that are backflowing into your residence because the there was not a check valve installed yeah. and the sanitary district is being flooded out and those systems because of the rising waters are pushing back into the residences and, and creating a very unhealthy you know situation and a very expensive cleanup not to mention yeah and and so just just that one thing alone right is a, is a game changer for us. But now in this is, I shared with you earlier uh, that we've created multiple layers of value because they were, frankly, we were compelled to. And so when you're Zs for a customer, you're sitting inside our structure, you're safe, your personal belongings, all of those things that are sentimentally valuable to you, whether they're physical belongings or they are family members or neighbors or whoever it might be. You're going to be safe inside of our structure. Now, where it gets very interesting is everyone is used to the lights going out when there's a hurricane. Everyone, the power goes out, right? Not with the Z-sphere. 
when you're one of our clients and you have our power appliance, you are going to have power before, during, and after the hurricane. Un undisrupted, right? Continuous power that is unique in the world today. It doesn't exist. And if I may, I'm John, I'm going to take a little segue here and, and share with your audience what we, one of the things that we did to accommodate that is, that is unique in the world. Yeah. We, are in the process, we are in the process of patenting a wind generation system for the sphere that takes advantage of the shape of the sphere, but also has design characteristics. And this is the first time anyone is ever going to hear this in the world. It takes advantage of the fact that you have excessive winds. If you have a wind generator, why wouldn't you take advantage of the fact that the wind is blowing 100 miles an hour outside? Every wind yeah. power solution today has to be shut off or immobilized during a high wind event to protect the investment and its integrity because it will blow up. It'll overheat or it'll explode. Not with the Z-sphere. What we are in the process of patenting is we have created a wind generator that will operate. I don't care if the wind's blowing 100 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour, 200 miles an hour. Our wind generator will provide optimal continuous power for our clients during a hurricane. And that is the first, that is the first of its kind and it's unique. And so we, as I shared, you know, and, and Amjad, I understand this is why, right, you, you and I both are so excited about the solution is, is there are many layers of value yeah. here that have, that, have lit that have truly created a solution that allows people to deal with adverse climate situations. And it's not that we just did a building or we just did power or we just did water. We did it all. And so you have a comprehensive package here. In addition to our power system, we also have two, water two potable water generation systems. We can either collect rainwater, you know, there's certain jurisdictions around the world that are not keen on people collecting rainwater. But in those cases, we understood that there are those, you know, they're very few, but in those cases, we also created an alternative to where we are actually collecting and storing water that we collect out of the atmosphere. So where our clients have sufficient humidity, we are collecting water from the atmosphere, storing that, and then we filter it prior to use. And it's, it's stored in a, in a very safe, secure place inside the Z-sphere. So, very smart. Right. So regardless, if you're having those high wind events or whatever else it is, that infrastructure is completely protected and preserved. And so our, our clients are going to have power. They're going to have water. We are in the midst of, you know, septic systems are underground. So typically our clients aren't, um, they're not having as big an issue when they have a septic system. Yeah. But we, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you that myself and, and my engineers, we're in the process of developing a fully standalone wastewater system. They are out there. They exist. Um, no one has figured out um, until now. No one has had a package like ours that really made economical or functional sense. And so we are going to change the market in that category as well. And we will be interesting, introducing a fully standalone wastewater system later this year, early next year for our clients that live in those areas that are susceptible to storm surge or floods to where all of those systems are intact. So if your sphere has to rise with the floodwater, you're not worried about any tethers or anything else, you know, restraining you from being able to do that. So, it, it, you know, a, a very, uh, we've addressed the complete spectrum of disaster resilience and frankly, empowerment. And so getting back to my, my Z-Sphere client experience, when you're a Z-Sphere client and you have our complete solution, you're experiencing no disruption to any of your essential needs, your personal belongings, your well-being, no disruption, zero. And so it puts you in a completely different frame of mind. Yeah. When, the, when the hurricane passes, the first thing that happens 
if, if you haven't been busy taking video inside of your sphere, documenting <laughs> your experience, right? That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm really anxiously awaiting that day. But the next thing that's going to happen is when you open that door after the event for the first time, when you open that door, your mindset is completely different. Your mindset is, I have all my essential needs. I have my belongings. I have everything you know, that, that I need in my life. How can I begin to help others and my community return to normal? Yeah, very smart point. Very, right. very smart point. Yeah. And, and so we we change the the entire mentality, even you know, on a social and a and a community level to where it's one of empowerment. And so that that is to me, that is one of the strongest. Uh, compelling propositions in our solution is that you are empowering a community to respond very quickly, minimize the GDP and other economic and, and functional impacts of a natural disaster to create as, as great a level of continuity in life and business as possible. And so whether you're whether you're an individual consumer or resident, residential consumer of our solution, or if you're a commercial consumer or business owner, imagine if you're on Abaco Island and you are one of the few doctor's offices on the island and you decided to invest in a Z-sphere and you have a category four or five event go through like Dorian. What is going to happen the next day after the hurricane is over? All of your competitors that chose not to do a Z's for solution, they're going to be out of business. Yeah. And a lot you of people are doctor, going to need your help. A lot of people are going to need your help. Absolutely. So as the physician that took it upon himself to invest in the Z sphere and understanding and, and you know being progressive minded, understanding the value, now you've put yourself in a position, you're in business when everyone else is out of business. And so now you can lend tremendous value to the community towards their, their you know, rebuilding and everything else. And so let me take that further in, the, in, the, in the, the commercial business space. If you are a Walmart, if you're a Costco, if you are a CVS, if you're any one of those corporate entities that exists on the island of Puerto Rico, wouldn't it be beneficial to have a Z-Sphere as an operational command center that has all of your compute infrastructure, it has all your sensitive records, whether they be paper or digital. Yeah. It is a place for your staff to go so that they can be safe and have a place to operate from if for some reason your other operations have been disabled and don't have power, whatever else. You your know, point, David, it could be an excellent war room, com mission, command center, mission yeah. control, command center. When exactly. you need, when you need a place that is very stable, and from there, your teams can safely, you know, leverage their mental creative skills to make the best possible, smartest possible decisions in the moment. Uh, so that is also another, you know, amazing use case for, for this. A absolutely. And, and so we talked about residential, we talked about commercial. Now let's talk about municipal. Yeah. So at the municipal level, one of the greatest challenges in Puerto Rico that there are over 70, nobody knows this, there are over 70 municipalities on the island of Puerto Rico. As wow. small an island as it is, there are massive yeah. amount of municipalities. Yeah. And so we have engaged many of them. And thank you to those progressive municipalities that have embraced our solution. We are well along the path to helping them implement our solution and set them on a course for true sustainability and frankly, leadership. In, uh, in the world as far as resilient and sustainable building. So from a municipal perspective, imagine that same command center for municipality, for dispatching and coordinating resources during these events, your critical staff 
they can bring their family, they can bring everyone there so that they know they're safe and they're not preoccupied and worried about, hey, you know, how's my family doing? We, we, have, we have complete blueprints such that we can accommodate those people during those times of need, as well as we are also, we've begun the discussions around providing and building resilient schools for Puerto Rico. So over, yeah. excuse me, over 200 schools were decimated and rendered unusable by the recent earthquakes and the hurricanes, over 200. Most of their students are currently experiencing their education in very makeshift scenarios, whether it's under tarps or tents or storage containers, whatever it might be. And so there's a tremendous opportunity here for the school systems of Puerto Rico to, and, and I talked about our 20 foot unit and our 30 foot unit. We originally had started with a 40 foot unit, especially for our municipal and, and commercial clients, but we've recently made the, the strategic decision to increase that to a 50 foot structure providing us additional square footage. And there's some, some additional design characteristics which make the 50 better than the 40. And so for situations where we need resilient schools, we have a solution. And not only that, but especially in the municipalities of Puerto Rico, those schools, those resilient schools when you're in need and in time of disaster, those can be utilized as a community shelter. So, so, one, of, so, so one of the other things that COVID has done is it has raised a tremendous amount of acute awareness around densely, densely, you know, grouped settings, whether it's, you know, concerts or sports venues or you know, uh, conferences, whatever it might be. So school. And, and so one of the things that has come to light is the fact that Z-Sphere is not all about scaling up in terms of size, because think about all of the commercial office space that's out in the world today that's going to need to be reinvented because people are not going back to use them. So we are no longer, our paradigm has shifted in the world from a scale up world to where we have bigger structures, more complexities, more challenges around sustaining those to a scale out world. So in our case, instead of having one big school, what's going to happen is we are going to have a cluster of two or three 50 foot spheres that accommodate the same number of students and they're all connected via elevated walkways and all kinds of fun stuff. But here's the important point. When you're dealing with a smaller, more manageable structure, you can accommodate treatment of the air quality and the atmosphere. They're easier to disinfect and you have a better situation overall in terms of effective treatment in dealing with these type of adverse scenarios, whether it's yeah. a hurricane or a pandemic, right? I think, uh, David, your point is spot on that, hey, the, the days are gone for uh, scale up and big unsustainable structures. Uh, this term that you used, scale out, uh, it, it's, it's highly relevant in the universe in which now we are living in, uh, and we will be finding ourselves more and more of us living. The other thing that is fascinating to me, David, is all the thoughts that you have shared with me that, hey, look, you know, we talk about uh, artificial intelligence and, you know, the smartness of human creativity and design, but let's also take a look at nature. And in nature, you were just using earlier example of self-organizing complex systems like honeybee structures that how uh, mother nature have created designs that have a lot of robustness, resilience, scalability to it. And, and that is, you know, an AI right there for us to use and explore and we can test 
its engineering properties, its functional properties and whatnot, to your point, only to find out that uh, nature in many of those self-organizing systems have solved for all different kind of optimality uh, and, and, and your designs are, you know, all this inspiration that you have taken from nature and added your own creativity to it, it speaks volumes to that point. The other part that is fascinating to me uh, is connectivity that uh, we now live in the world where uh, augmented reality, mixed reality, that is uh, the name of the situation and resilient robust bandwidth. So then if you are uh, living in uh, a dome like this and you are experiencing a sustainable quality of life and you're able to withstand whatever mother nature throws at you, but in between and even during, uh, you can connect with other people, you know, whether in a a uh, social setting or work setting or in an educational setting, uh, not just tools like Zoom, but uh, as time goes by, uh, more and more enriched mixed reality, augmented reality environments are coming and, and your dome structure is optimal to, you know, uh, sometimes you may not even need uh, additional virtual reality headsets, the dome itself can play that role. Or even if you're using uh, virtual reality headsets and, and whatnot, point is uh, you are connected with uh, your work setting, your community setting, your church setting, telemedicine, your, you know, uh, your, your universities, your schools, colleges. So, uh, so while people want to live wherever they want to live, because, you know, to your point, uh, it is a uh, choice that, you know, uh, I want to live, you know, in, the, in, in Wyoming, close to nature, or no, I don't have a choice. I'm living uh, on a coastal line or a, near a river, river because of uh, economics and other things and other forms of supply chains that are around me. Uh, the, Combination of uh, all these technologies, uh, David, make it self-organizing, self-reliant, autonomous, distributed, and a network of nodes so that, you know, you are no longer a victim of a big structure or a bad design wiping you completely out and then everyone is looking for a help, which you and I, we both know that as time goes by, you know, unless we build, you know, armies of robots and stuff, there is no way to provide sustainable help. So help like in biological organisms or things in nature, it has to come from within. It has to be intrinsically built. It has to be an intrinsic feature of the system and not expecting some other external miraculous sources for help uh, because they are just over time not sustainable because you and I, we both know that the, the help sources, they are susceptible and vulnerable to the very same challenges that we are. So, so a structure like this, you know, where most nodes in the network First of all, all nodes are connected and most nodes, you know, are not taken down by a, uh, such an event. Uh, then our ability of that intrinsic resilience, intrinsic self-organization, ability to recover quickly uh, and, and keep it all contained within communities, that is a lot more a reliable model of sustainability, supply chain and whatnot. I, David, I, 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 I am compelled to say the following. Some of this I heard from you, uh, some of that I heard from some professors at MIT that uh, uh, 
So this professor one time was saying, look, if you are predicting that you in your genetic makeup or somehow down the road, you are susceptible to a certain type of cancer or a certain type of disease pathology. One way to solve for that is you starting from today, 30 years before you are getting that cancer, start behaving as if you have the cancer. And you start the diet pattern, lifestyle changes, other things around you. So start living, okay, I am in the middle of that cancer. I am consciously experiencing it, you know, run that mental simulation and start living it uh, and say, okay, I'm gonna make changes around me uh, because you know, I have this situation. So that kind of a thinking that, you know, that why we need to think about it now, where we are imagining a lot more hostile planet. In fact, in some of your conversations with me, we are imagining us almost living on a different planet, you know, as if living on earth one day doesn't even feel like living on earth. It feels a foreign experience. Absolutely. And then the game theory is if we start changing our supply chains, our designs, our systems, then maybe when that day comes, we not only we would be more better prepared, but it would not be that surprising because we will be you know, ready. And then the act of preparation, going back to this MIT professor talking about this cancer example, you would say, well, game theoretically, if you do that, it's more likely the cancer that was going to hit you in 20 or 30 years probably will not hit you for 50 years. And you are buying time. And buying time always is an awesome thing if you can buy time less expensively. And his thing in that cancer analogy was that, hey, look, then if you are so prepared, even if it hits its impact, its real impact and its perceived conscious impact would be less. So hence, you can sustain a quality of living over a long time. And in your case, David, your model is not just, you know, one individual doing that mental simulation, but it is more for, you know, many more people, you know, communities, smaller communities, bigger communities, but more importantly, David, it is a vision for how we need to think differently. We can no longer just continue with life as status quo. That is no longer an acceptable answer. And, you know, it is funny that, you know, sometimes we, you know, can say, well, okay, uh, this community got hit, that community got hit, but I'm fine, you know, I'm in my living room, you know, I'm eating my burger, you know, and I'm gonna, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm doing whatever, and I'm, you know, it's news for me. And to your point, one day pretty soon, it is no longer going to be news for me either. I too will be in the middle of that. And that is a mind shift uh, that, you know, that we all need to go through. Uh, so in that sense, I'm, you just, your message is so powerful. My question, David, to you is how soon you will be living in one such thing, how <laughs> soon I can have one for, for me. And then, you know, uh, things like that require coalitions, alliances, collaboration. Uh, what kind of coalitions and alliances you are building with, you know, municipalities, other forms of local or state or federal government, uh, and just education, you know, in terms of uh, uh, these days, uh, CEOs of big corporations, they carry, you know, so much vision and power. Uh, what is your ideal design scenario in terms of the health and collaboration uh, that, you are, that you would expect to see, David, in the, in the, in the months and years to come to really uh, realize this vision 
at a at a much at a much wider scale and deployments in targeted uh, communities and you know and 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 learning and learning from that as we go along. Certainly, Amjad, thank you. And and if I may, before I I start there, one of the things that I've always admired about you is your ability to apply concepts and advanced theories to reality and your ability to legitimately execute. And so I believe one of the reasons why we get along so well is because we too were all about execution. Yeah. And so the, it, was very, it was very important to me to, posi- to spend the 10 years, put ourselves in a position to where we could massively execute. And so to, to your, your point and your ask, where we are right now is this structure is built and we are in the process of raising capital to finish this model home. The most important thing for our prospects and for everyone to understand and realize is that it's real. It exists. I want to come. I want to see it. I want to walk through it. I want to experience it and know that it's real. So we are in the process of launching a a 506C here in the next week. And you're going to be able to go to our website and we will have investment details and we'll take you, you know, to where you can go look at all, all of the, the background information and everything that, uh, that an investor typically would. So the other thing that I did was I, I shared with you that I'm first and foremost a pragmatist and not an engineer. And so part of the greatest challenge that we've actually created for ourselves is there is so much money out there right now. There are trillions of dollars of wealth out there. I, I, I actually created such an efficient model. Our initial 506C is for a million dollars, right? And what I've come to find is that most investors are out there looking for tranches of 10, 20, or more million dollars to invest because it's, it's certainly more efficient to do that when you have a lot of wealth. Yeah. And so... That said, we're, we're, we, have, we have taken our time to do it right. We are looking for the right investment partner. We know they're out there. They're going to get our vision 100% and get behind us. And, and now what I'm going to share with you is what happens next. So as part of that initial investment, we're going to finish the model home. We've got some additional patent work and some additional engineering relationships One of which I want to highlight here real quick. One of the engineering relationships that we have and that we are, that we are investing in is, and and what, what I haven't shared yet is the structure that you see in front of you. And I know most of you are familiar with the performance of a Yeti cooler. So the structure that you're looking in front of you has nearly twice the thermal performance and insulating value as a Yeti cooler. Wow. So one of, the, one of the real challenges and problems that we solve that no one else has is the thermal dynamics of a structure and how it uses energy, specifically power. And so because of what we've done with the structure, we have brought our power profile for heating and cooling down to literally hundreds of watts. It's nothing. And so what that means now, when you take and you invest in a relationship where you're dealing with highly advanced heating and cooling technologies, it, 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 puts, us, it puts us on a, on a level that it, it literally, it's literally Jetsons versus Flintstones, for those of you that are familiar with that vernacular. So very, very advanced. And, and so those are the types of things that we're investing on here or investing in here early on, because those are the game changers that we're going to be able to just refine, 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 and get better and better at over time. So where are we going next? So after, we go, uh, yes, yes. Before, before we go there, people who want to uh, invest in your company, people who want to uh, 
experience what the living in this dome is like. Uh, just share with everybody uh, where can they go, like perhaps your website and stuff to find all this information for a uh, 3D tour of this experience and then you sure. know, uh, investment details and how, what is your advice for uh, interested uh, parties, investors uh, to get hold of you. So may maybe let's spend maybe a couple minutes on that. Sure, thank you, Amjad. So we have, we have partnered with two specific entities as you can, as, as you know, we've got a tremendous uh, interest in, in wow. creating, creating a, a new Puerto Rico. And so we have partnered with an, an outfit called Invest Puerto Rico. Okay. They're a non-for-profit non entity, and they are all about promoting and showcasing investment opportunities and business opportunities on the island of Puerto Rico. And their website is investpr.org. Right. Our offering will be going live on their site next week. Awesome. Awesome. Yep. So that's one place. The other place that you can go is to fundable.com. Okay. So for those interested parties that might not be so aligned with Puerto Rico, and you can do either, it, it all goes to the same cause, but we've also provided that as an alternative platform because we know Fundable has thousands, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of investors in their community. And they're more, they're more US centric, you know, mainland centric. Yeah. So we're starting in Puerto Rico, but we are going to go, you know, throughout the US, you know, as we get further down our, our business progress. So those are the best ways to get a hold of us. The other way is just to send an email to ir at myzsphere.com. And that goes to our investor relations team and merely request you know, investment information. Um, we'll provide you a, a nice executive summary. And then if there's interest, we can certainly follow on and provide you access to our data room and you can get into the, the nitty gritty of our offering and, and other details of our business. So th thank you for that, Amjad. Love it, love it. Now, please continue with you were talking about what next and the vision uh, of moving forward. Yeah, and so this is where I get really excited. So please bear with me. So the, 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 journey, the journey thus far has just been absolutely fascinating from, from an innovator, from a founder, you know, from a leadership standpoint. I, I have, I, I'm truly blessed to have the team that I do. It took me a lot of time to find people with integrity, you know, as most of the leadership understands on this call, it's all around, it's all about the people that you have around you and the people that are covering your blind side so that when something unexpected happens, you're able to collaborate and quickly solve the problem. And so I, I'm blessed to have that core team. And so I, I'm very excited where we're going next. We're going to raise this initial small round of funds to you know, put, those, put those pieces into place to where we have a model home here that we can showcase and then build from. And then after that, we're, we're likely going to do a larger, a larger raise of 5 million or 10 million or more, it depends on the investor and, and what we're doing and where we're going. So right now I have been blessed with my team has qualified over two years of opportunities for us just on the island of Puerto Rico. There are other opportunities in, in other entities within the U.S., but we're really focused in Puerto Rico for now. So we have plenty of business down there to last us, frankly, for probably the rest of my life, if I'm just being candid, and which is, which is a good problem to have. Here's, here's where we're different that we will succeed where others have failed. So the uniqueness of our solution not only spans the resiliency of the building and the systems that we've integrated into it, but the other thing that's special about it is the way that we build it and our ability to scale in terms of production, in terms of deployment. So the structure that you see in front of you is 100% modular. It's all pre-constructed. 
So the way that our business model will work moving forward is we are going to go plant seeds with a few model homes in Puerto Rico. We'll probably do one on the Virgin Islands because it's very close and it's also U.S. territory. There are massive, everyone is vacationing in Puerto Rico and St. Croix right now because it's such, it's so difficult to go overseas anywhere. Yeah. because of COVID restrictions and quarantines and everything else. Everybody's going to Puerto Rico and St. Croix. I can't blame them. So the islands are going to have a tremendous amount of economic capital influx and needs for, you know, buildings for, um, for permanent residents, for rental, et cetera. So a lot of activity happening down there just organically because of COVID. So the, the next, we, we plant the seeds with the model homes to showcase those and, and frankly demonstrate through an event next hurricane season, not this one, we won't get it done this year, but next hurricane season, we will have several model homes built throughout the island, if not one or two small communities already built. And what our, 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 our other municipal prospects and other people will see is the fact that those go through those events unscathed. And once that happens, then everyone, you know, it's, it's all about validation. And so once that validation occurs, then it's just, it's going to be a nice ramp. And what we've done is we put ourselves in a position from a business model perspective where I've designed the business model such that we can scale very quickly from the few models that we're doing in the small communities to several dozen, then a hundred, then 500, then over a thousand. And one of the unique things that I want to share with, with everyone today is, and this is a, this is a recent development. And a lot of this stems from earlier discussions and really touches on actually our discussion on Jot around uh, other planets, right? Yeah, and being able to being able to transport materials and, and having a, a realistic situation to where you could utilize the same design literally in other worlds. So, you know, we're going to start here at home first, right? Mother Earth is our home, and we're going to do the best that we can to preserve and maintain it. So, one of the recent developments that we've had is the structure that you see in front of you is incredibly lightweight. So I have worked diligently with our team over the last many months on developing a modular construction strategy to where we are going to build a factory within the next two years in Puerto Rico. And what's going to happen is we are going to literally pre-build these structures to the, the with the exception of the largest one, the 20 footers and the 30 footers, we will build those to water tightness. And so they'll have their windows installed. And, and this picture here is, is, I apologize, we don't yet have the windows in. And as you can imagine, the supply logistics nightmares out there right now, the lead times on windows and wood and doors and everything, it's incredible. So the structure that you see in front of you will have many, many windows. It'll have a lot of sunlight. It'll be very, very warm and inviting interior on the inside. It won't be this tight you know, uh, shell that you see here. Uh, so what's going to happen is when we build that factory, we are going to pre-assemble the watertight structures and water and, and assemblies. And once those are assembled, we are going to roll them out of the plant. So this, think of this as a modular building plant. So we are literally building the modular structures. I shared with you that the structure that you see in front of you took two men less than three weeks to build. We are going to get our modular construction of this structure that's ready, frankly, to go out into the marketplace. We're gonna get this process down to a matter of a couple of days. Love right? it. And so what that means is, it means we can achieve the scalability that I just mentioned, but the key on the island of Puerto Rico and frankly, other geographies around the country and around the world is this. Once you implement and install the right factory with the right volume potential and everything else, the next challenge that you have, especially on the island of Puerto Rico, and this is why Puerto Rico has faced so many challenges around a fast reconstruction and fast rebuild, 
logistically the roads and the terrain and everything else they're quite challenging quite difficult to get to so we came up with a, a unique solution to that problem is that our structure is such is so lightweight that we are going to deploy within the next few years we are going to deploy a methodology that has never been seen before we are going to pre-build our watertight and structures at our factory and we are going to airlift them to the site wow yeah and Dude. so yeah. yes Love it. yes and so what that means is now we're unconstrained yeah. by the terrain and the other logistical, you know, the people problems and moving materials and everything else for that very critical phase to where we will be deploying watertight structures or near watertight structures that when those are deployed, I don't care if a category five hurricane comes through, they're going to stay there and they're going to be intact and the investment will be preserved. And there's not an entity in the world that I know is doing that today. And so we are going to deploy the very, you know, best of the best methodologies and everything else to provide maximum effect on delivering as many of these as we can and creating as much resiliency for the island of Puerto Rico initially as we can. And that's one of the ways that we can do it. I can clearly see, David, with, uh, with this, this kind of vision and this kind of an execution and innovation strategy, the smart capital, uh, socially savvy capital that is available out there that so many individuals, institutes, organizations, both private and public, will be interested in being a part of this vision rather and if you are, this is a solution for a planet, not for just community A or community B. So hence, there is room for everybody to invest and uh, deploy these structures and then for others to you know, own them, rent them, use them like all different types of business models. And to your point, uh, I love your strategy that how you're going to build an ecosystem of like-minded partners uh, from you know an insurance perspective, other perspectives. Uh, it totally sort of you know disruptive idea, David. And I'm so happy to see that it is coming to fruition. I cannot wait to see that where over the next uh, few months, over the next few years, where you are going to take it. You are certainly you know in terms of your choice of of Puerto Rico and other areas that you have mentioned, they are very wisely chosen because this, all these use cases are most relevant there to the needs of you know, uh, the communities and people living there. Uh, this is truly, truly amazing, David, and I uh, am so looking forward to many more conversations along, uh, along this journey. Uh, and look, you know, I personally will be, you know, uh, working with and participating in any way, any which way that I can be helpful and uh, play a role. This is I am I I as Amjad, I am drawn to this vision, uh, and I also one day would love to see structures like that on other uh, alien worlds, other planets. Uh, but hey, look, you know, to your point. We live here on Earth, and we need we need solutions, you know. Here, uh, and to your point, you know, uh, this is not an answer for everything, but these choices they give you flexibility and resilience and robustness, uh, and drawing upon the principles from nature. Uh, so, in that sense. It is very unique. I am sure, David, that the people who are going to watch uh, the podcast, uh, they have never, you know, seen something like this. Or, uh, and I think the the very last thing I'll say is your conviction behind it and the fact that you have been thinking about it now for decades. 
and then you are figuring out how you have taken all these steps and you are, you, you are building a team, you are building a momentum. Uh, so this is going to be David also. I'm so glad that we took time today to talk and thank you for being so, being so gracious with, with your time and telling your story. Love it. Likewise, Amshad, thank you so much for the opportunity to be here.